I've been invited to moderate panel two under the title Analysis of the Conflict and Its Results. We have three presenters in attendance here, but before introducing each of them, I would take the liberty to say a couple of words about the topic of the conference, which I believe would help to put the panel in a broader context. The title of the conference reflects many Ukrainian and not just Ukrainian problems and challenges related to geopolitics, post-communist social and economic transformation, as well as peculiar national building process in the Orthodox, East European, or Eurasian worlds. We cannot give any convincing explanation of what is going on in Donbass without answering two direct questions. What is Ukraine? and what is Russia. Ukraine, perceived in terms of geography and civil state nation doctrine, implies that people who are living currently in the Crimea and the Donbass are Ukrainians who found themselves under the Russian occupation. For Ukraine, articulated within ethnic cultural discourse, those uh, on the Donbass territory are predominantly Soviet Russians or ethnic Russians, which makes them may be useless for a successful Ukrainian nation state building. However, as every historian knows, Russia is also a very complex phenomenon. There are inherent contradictions between Rossiysky and Ruski, between the Russian state and the Russian spiritual world, between Russianness as ethnic and religious categories. National, regional, religious, as well as social economic aspects of the issue should be also taken into account. History matters. Look at the projects of Novorossiya or DNR or even Malorossiya. They are all based on a certain interpretation of history. Even more so, sometimes it looks like our analytics in fact create certain discourses like original identities, rather than reflect and analyze social reality. And besides, who would blame historians nowadays for dealing with outdated issues after the historical events dated more than 300 years became politically activated, as the issue of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church demonstrates? All that brings me to the other aspect of the Donbass issue, to the state of the art in contemporary Ukrainian studies, which is my area of expertise. I am under the impression that Western academia demonstrates the same level of personal and political involvement as both Ukrainian and Russian academics do. It seems to be deeply divided between the pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainian discourses. Some view the situation in Donbass as a civil war, separatist action, terrorist operation, proxy war, or a hybrid war. The labels rebels, separatists, terrorists, Russian collaborators are commonly used to identify those behind the line. These are politically charged definitions. We have no other language so far to describe the conflict in Donbass, which makes us all involved in one way or another. Let's have no illusions about that. I believe that's all we can do under the circumstances is to share some observations and findings and discuss them with mutual respect and tolerance in accordance with academic norms and values. But politicians don't need our opinion anymore. Our first speaker, Oksana Mikheyeva, is a historian turned sociologist. She's professor of sociology, head of the department of sociology at the U Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. She graduated from the Donetsk National University. Her candidate dissertation is devoted to the crime and the struggle against it in Donbass, 1921-1928. Her doctoral dissertation's title is Establishment and Functioning of Law Enforcement Agencies of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Same, 1921-1928. Uh, uh, Dr. Mikheyeva's current interests include urban sociology, history of Ukraine, sociology and history of everyday life. She is the author of over 100 publications published in Ukraine, United Kingdom, Germany, France, Hungary, Romania, Lithuania, and Russia. She has led or participated in over 20 local and international sociological projects focusing on symbolic of urban space, Ukrainian refugees, 
Armed Conflicts, Methodologies of Sociological Survey. Today, Dr. Mikheyeva will be talking about motivations of combatants on both sides of the war on the territory of Donbass region. I would like to outline the scope of my research. I focused my attention on regular people who were willing to rejoin military uh, action in part of Donetsk and Lugansk region on both sides. Why is that? First of all, the voluntary nature of their decision allows us to work with their motivation. Second of all, we are speaking of regular people who are usually the silent participants of events. Leaders of volunteer military formation have visibility, they give interviews and publish program documents. World view and motivation of reg regular uh, participants remain unheard. That is where a question emerges, uh, to what degree does their motivation coincide with the declared values and instructions? Thirdly. Significant uh, change in everyday reality make people review and uh, reconfigure the system of knowledge and uh, cultural patterns. The study of what happens to regular structures uh, in consciousness under extreme circumstances help us to understand when knowledge about reality transforms for each specific person. As a result, it is possible to understand the profound foundation on one's motivation, which in this case makes them voluntary participants of military conflict. This study is based on the analysis of narrative materials from 58 in-depth interviews, 22 interviews with members of pro-Russian voluntary military formation on territories not controlled by Ukraine. This group uh, include both people from region and citizens of Russian Federation, and 36 interviews with members of pro-Ukrainian voluntary military formation. The research took place in autumn 2015, when pro-Ukrainian voluntary military formations were mostly integrated into the state system of Ukrainian armed forces, and the pro-Russian forces were under single control in the quasi-states of Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic. The respondents were, on the one hand, carrying fresh experience and their own adaptation to war, and on the other hand, they were in the middle of the initial return to peaceful life. Let me introduce you with the logic of my talk. First, I would talk about social and demographic parameters of self and self-identification of combatants of both sides of the war, because it is important to understand uh, their motivation. Second, I would talk about the main scenarios of 2013-2014 events in Ukraine. And third, we will talk uh, about specific of combatants' motivation. Uh, all respondents are divided in two um, conditional groups, pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainian groups of combatants. Uh, lack of accurate data regarding social and demographic parameters of combatants means that we cannot speak about them within statistically important indicators. Yet, a structured social and demographic block of the guide allows uh, for review of the basic parameters of groups and give us the opportunity to talk about general trends. Because of the lack of time, I can't describe all aspects of social and demographic parameters and self-identification of respondents, but I would uh, like to stop for the most important aspects. There are certain differences between pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian combatants in their models of education and professional careers. In pro-Russian group, educational parameters are almost in equal proportion, represented by vocational education, mostly technical profession, which is explained by the specific of the region, and higher education. Nonetheless, review of biographical narratives of the respondents show dominance of the strategy for getting several degrees, even more so in rather unexpected combination. For instance, radiophysics and electronics and cultural studies. Uh, the respondents express their disappointment in education, uh, confirm the feeling of injustice uh, in distribution of opportunities and changes already during education stage. When asked about professional careers, they uh, answer with pauses, picking out the right words, and feel uneasy because of the need to speak of their lack of fulfillment. Uh, for example, I worked here and there, nothing interesting, work as usual, I couldn't find anything for my degree, etc. Uh, in the pro-Ukrainian group of combatants, two-thirds of respondents have high education and several respondents have a doctoral degree. When talking about themselves, they mention successful studies and professional fulfillment. A majority have previous experience of staying with the military, army, or law enforcement bodies. As a separate case, we can single out Afghan war, vet uh, war veterans who are well organized in communities and very often have their own children of enlistment age. The latter was 
an intensifying factor for joining the combatants. We are also seeing differences in the way respondents identify their native tongue. Most pro-Russian combatants are Russian-speaking. Only a small number of the respondents stressed upon their bilingualism or lack of any problems in using both languages. Most respondents from the pro-Ukrainian combatants name Ukrainian as their native tongue, even if they choose Russian during the interview. One third of the respondents are Russian speakers, but they stress upon their desire to master Ukrainian and make it a language for everyday use. Actualization of uh, this issue is reflected in the way people talk about these things and the uh, emphasis that they are making. Thus, when asked about language of everyday use, pro-Ukrainian Russian speaking combatants often replied, for example, unfortunately Russian, or I speak Russian, but I'm currently learning Ukraine, etc. Uh, the most significant difference is observed in national identity of respondents and their understanding of their own national identity. Most definition of nationalities that the pro-Russian combatants use are bright and fuzzy, which points to a trans trans transitory character of national identity, showing it in the process of transformation. Nationality is not tied to a certain state-like construct. It does not have clear geographic limits. We can single out several groups of pro-Russian combatants according to their understanding of national identity. The first group of respondents uh, emphasize on their Slavic character, which in their interpretation becomes a kind of bridge between rejected identification with Ukraine and the attempts to create their new identity that would legitimize their becoming part of Russian society as one of their own. Slavic character is viewed in Russian context only but appeals new to modern Russian statehood, but to Russian character, which is closer to Soviet understanding of Eastern Slavism as a single community that Ukrainians, Russians, and Belarusians all come from. The second group uh, identify, uh, identify themselves with a local space, uh, and as their nationality, they indicate Donetsk man or woman. In this variation of identity, we observe, on the one hand, their forced distancing both from Ukraine and from Russia, and on the other hand, we see the traces of messianic calling. Later was the element of Novorossia, ideological construct, which, by the way, is mentioned by respondents in the past tense, and that shows that the construct lost its uh, uh, relevance back in 2015. The minority group articulates its Ukrainian identity, but in this case, it is a specific construct of Ukrainian character, which is closer to Soviet Ukrainian identity, uh, inherited from the Soviet Union, which is opposed to the Ukrainian ethnocultural and pro-European identity. All these Soviet pro-Ukrainian combatants identify themselves as Ukrainians. Specification of this uh, identification allows for certain segmentation within the group. Most respondents understand their Ukrainian identity within the context of national statehood, uh, its borders and citizenship, and do not connect it to ethnicity. For example, well, my grandmothers were Polish, but I feel Ukrainian. Uh, I am a Ukrainian Georgian or Georgian Ukrainian. The other put uh, emphasis on emotional ties to Ukrainian land, uh, its tradition and history. Most respondents automatically identify themselves as Ukrainians, yet when asked to specify their national identity, they are facing troubles. It means that in this case, identification as Ukrainians is obvious for the group, it is not subject to doubt, and the requirement for specification is unmotivated. Only several respondents show a certain transitory state of national identification, stressing that recent events made them think not so much about their national identity, but more about what it stands for. We can also trace uh, construction of group identities, which in narratives are expressed in outlining familiar and close surrounding in such categories as we and ours, and construction of social distance, which the group marked as they and other. When constructing their group, Russian combatants present themselves within the context of regional activism uh, and within the defense paradigm. Uh, the circle of those who are perceived as other in a negative context is rather wide. Among the provisional external for them others, they name Maidan participants, new Ukrainian government, residents of Western Ukraine, Europe, collective West, the US, Crimean Tatars. Internal for them others, 
it's pseudo combatants, those who wear military uniform but have never been to the battlefield, passive residents of the quasi states of DNR LNR who do nothing during all this time and were just waiting for the situation to take a certain turn, returners, uh, meaning IDPs who left Donbass during the intense phase of military action and have now come back. The same distant perception through their category, but in positive or neutral context, is demonstrated toward Russia, Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, and the Russian army, a Russian military men. So, in general, we may say that pro-Russian combatants as a group are a closed off, is isolated. Potential group for positive solidarization are practically not mentioned. Participants of pro-Ukrainian voluntary military formation identify themselves, first of all, with military men and volunteers, with people of Ukraine as the object of aggression, with those who share Maidan values, and also with the Ukrainian society in context of failures and blame for the war. Uh, for example, if we don't solve the problem of building the new government, we will have no prospects as a country and no prospect as a nation. They speak of state as a political institution and its key representatives, including top military men in their categories. They are all interested in the war to go on. Generals studied back in Soviet times, they probably had close ties to Russia. The same they categories are used for Russian Federation and Putin as subject of aggression as well as, well as separatist. According to the definition of respondents, there are representatives of territories not controlled by Ukraine who are actively involved in the military conflict. Unlike the previous group, pro-Ukrainian combatants do not feel isolated. They act both on behalf of the military and also associate themselves with the people of Ukraine. Living representatives of the Ukrainian government and generals outside the hour circle testifies to tension between regular defenders and the power vertical. The main scenarios of the 2013-2014 events in Ukraine, which are constructed by the participants of pro-Russian combatant formation, are uh, as following. The situation in Donbas is viewed in the context of geopolitical scenario in which the provisional collective West is perceived uh, unambiguously negatively and Russia is presented as a country which fights the West and shares Ukraine together with it. The next level of knowledge about the situation is its description uh, as an internal problem of Ukraine. The respondents tend to classify their action as a reaction to pressure or expressed aggression of their part of Ukrainian government. Their own actions are presented as a fight for freedom, justice, uh, and are characterized as a people's rebellion. Internal lack of coordination of the reactive scenario and the image of active fighter for freedom is overcome at the express of chronological shifts which help replace cause with effect. All the levels of event are tied into internally organized and logical for respondent system by means on, of constructing the model of victim of circumstances. In such a way, their own activity is justified and the vector of responsibility for the tragic events is shifted to other groups represented on different levels, from regional to world. The general characteristic of narratives with regard to assessment of the events in their long term, chaotic character, confusion, abundance of details, uh, examples, interruption, arguments. In invisible dialogue uh, with provisional opponents, they appeal to collective West, the US and Europe, as well as the residents of Western Ukraine, so-called Banderites. In the dialogue with the provisional others, they use hate speech, which is manifested in uh, degrading and uh, offensive attributes. The next characteristic of the situation as provided by pro-Ukrainian combatants are shorter. The respondents do not switch between different ideas. They are not trying to dispute with the invisible opponent. Uh, this shows that the group has a common and shared interpretation of the situation. The key focus on this group Group's picture of event is placed on Russian aggression. Uh, interruption of the role of regular people contains justifying motives and presents them rather as victims to Russian propaganda and specific local policy, which resulted in their poetry, humiliation of their human dignity, and stipulated their choice not in favor of Ukraine. Acknowledgement is made of the uh, in Infashioned effort of the old Ukrainian government signs independence for the formation of unity in the society and promotion of common values for all. 
Hate speech is expressed to a lower extent in this found uh, in the tactics of dehumanization of the enemy, uh, enemy uh, amid getting used uh, to war conditions. For example, there are tags, schemes, they gazet drugs, etc. Their own military activities are seen as serving their duty and does not exceed the limits of uh, protection defense paradigm. Uh, contrasting the two group system of knowledge about everyday reality does not answer a uh, slightly ironic but completely scientific questions. Who is fighting the war in both sides are just defending themselves. And um, several words about motives. Motives for joining military formation are never one-sided. They are a mixture of rational and irrational components. In both groups and the study, we see uh, identical trends uh, in reconstruction of one's own motivation and the motivation of other, ours, its motivation of people of their own group and others, aliens, representatives of the opposite group. Regular conflict participants tend to speak of their own motivation in idealistic and irrational dimension. On others' hours' motivation, they speak in rational manner, pr proving certain uh, financial and social motives. Uh, other aliens are presented in rational and pragmatic tone with predominant negative connotation. Assessment of the motivation in the latter group contains two major scenarios, blaming and kindling. Correspondingly, when working with motivation of the representative of conflict and sites, we should factor in the presence of multi-layered motivation in which it is hard to single out irrational and rational motives. It means that the construct of retargeting of motives from war to peace should contain something that would give a person the feeling of benefit from stopping the military action, both from irrational point of view and rational point of view. Important for conflict transformation is work with practices of dehumanization of enemy, which emerge as a way of reconciling a person with the thought of mood. Enemy dehumanization mechanisms, speaking of enemy using the hate speech, the memory of personal and collective losses, record the conflict and block potential peace initiative. Accordingly, regardless of the turn to the events may take, there will be quite a lot highly motivated people who will be left dissatisfied, who will need to retarget and have compensation of their energy according to the structure of motives, both in irregular dimension and in rational dimension. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, Natalia Stepanyuk, our next speaker, is uh, currently affiliated with the Chair of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Ottawa. She majored in Comparative Politics at the School of Political Studies at the University of Ottawa. She recently finished her PhD last month. Her doctoral, uh, doctoral uh, research, supported by uh, the Peter and Doris School Doctoral Scholarship on Contemporary Ukraine, examines the ways civilians have mobilized to address the traumatic realities of the Donbass war. Dr. Stepanyuk's broader research interests include post-communist politics, civil society, gender politics, uh, militarization, demilitarization, and nationalism. Today, she is going to analyze the issue of changing modes of citizenship, civilian volunteer engagement in the frontline regions of Donbass, Ukraine. Uh, I'll preface my presentation by uh, saying that, broadly speaking, as Volodymyr mentioned, I studied the emergence and functioning of civilian volunteer networks uh, in the relatively uh, peaceful regions. I say relatively because there was a lot of instability there as well. So the regions uh, Easter, uh, eastern Ukraine and southern Ukraine. I analyzed the demographic profile of uh, civilian volunteers who got engaged, uh, also their motivations for engagement. And I also look at the effects of that engagement on volunteers th themselves, on their sense of national be belonging, uh, on their understanding of citizenship, social obligation, and politics more generally. My today's presentation consists of three parts. Uh, the first part looks at the type of civilian volunteer networks uh, that emerged amidst the Donbass war. Uh, the second part focuses on less visible and less acknowledged aspects of volunteer engagement. And the third part explores the evolution of volunteer networks over time as the war entered the uh, protracted and uh, routinized phase. 
Uh, my presentation is based on the field work I conducted in Kharkiv, uh, Dnipropetrovsk, uh, or uh, Dnipro, uh, Odessa in 2015. I interviewed 95 civilian volunteers and also conducted participant observation of their work. Based on the materials I collected, I identified three types of uh, volunteer networks. Uh, and uh, the first cluster of volunteers uh, that emerged uh, amidst the outbreak of war was, was um, those assisting the army. Uh, this cluster of volunteers had uh, very diverse and often uh, immensely difficult preoccupations. Its major task was the provision of material supplies to the uh, military, as the military uh, lacked very basic things. Um, and here I'm talking not only about uh, military equipment, uh, food, uh, clothing, but things like toilet paper or bullets. Uh, as one of my respondents said that I got uh, five bullets from my commander as a, as a birthday gift. Uh, like, what is five bullets? It's enough to maybe only commit suicide. But not to fight in the war. So uh, this cluster of volunteers worked to address these diverse, uh, diverse needs existing uh, in the army. And also um, they organized uh, rescue missions to locate the bodies of uh, missing soldiers to return the remains of uh, these soldiers back to their families. So immensely difficult psychologically and emotionally work. And one example of such network is Nabaiduji Lude, or Caring People. This network emerged uh, in Odessa in September of 2014 uh, sporadically to assist soldiers and voluntary battalion fighters. Uh, in the summer of 2015, when I collected information for my uh, research, this network, the leadership of this network consisted of uh, five um, female entrepreneurs uh, who did volunteer work on a full-time basis. Each volunteer had a separate sphere of responsibilities, uh, taking care of donations, taking care of social media accounts, uh, bringing the donations uh, to the front lines, and uh, creating the outreach uh, around their efforts. Only one of them uh, had a prior exper experience of uh, public engagement. Uh, four others uh, had no experience of that sort uh, whatsoever, and that same person, only one person, supported the Euromaidan protests. Um, we can say that uh, these are new people that uh, got active amidst the, uh, amidst the war in Ukraine. This network was able to increase uh, its outreach uh, and its capacity uh, thanks to partnerships with other volunteer networks. So for example, uh, female volunteers, uh, informally known as spider women, uh, the women who got together to knit uh, camouflage nets uh, for the army would provide their, um, uh, their nets to this network and uh, this network would deliver it to the front. Or similarly, cooking battalions would uh, get together cook food and send it to the front through this network. So uh, this uh, grassroots uh, organization was very efficient, very creative and very flexible, uh, something that allowed it to grow uh, very lar large and efficient. The second type of uh, volunteer networks uh, that emerged uh, was um, uh, those assisting internally displaced persons. Station Kharkiv uh, is one such example. It was the most developed network, network in Kharkiv. It was formed in the summer of 2014 uh, to aid those fleeing violence um, with uh, emergency assistance. It started with uh, ordinary citizens of Kharkiv uh, creating an assistant bo assistance booth at the train station uh, where displaced persons uh, often lacking uh, very basic science documentation would arrive uh, very highly distressed and uh, get uh, basic uh, assistance um, from, from volunteers. During some periods, uh, like uh, the Ilovites battle, uh, this network handled a very high uh, number of uh, the displaced on a daily basis. Uh, around seven hundred, seven to 800 people would arrive daily and um, get assistance. Over the first year of its uh, existence, uh, Station Kharkiv has expanded the kinds of services uh, they provide to IDPs. And the main focus shifted from emergency assistance provision to providing legal advice uh, and employment training to the internally uh, displaced persons. A separate branch um, station law was set up to provide legal consultation and improve IDPs' uh, legal literacy in terms of their rights and entitlements. Station success also emerged as a separate branch uh, to help IDPs adjust, adjust their professional qualifications to the new uh, 
market realities uh, to, to the new uh, job market um, in, uh, in Kharkiv. So these efforts were mainly directed uh, at integration and long-term settlement of IDPs. And similarly to the previous cluster, of most volunteers engaged in this type of work were new people that had no, no prior experience of public engagement. Uh, their coordination, assist, uh, coordination committee um, board consisted, uh, consisted of 23 people. Uh, most of them were women as well. Uh, that would uh, identify the course of uh, action and coordinate the activities of a marg ma much larger uh, group of volunteers. And the third type uh, of volunteer network uh, that emerged was hospital volunteers, uh, providing the diverse assistance to those uh, injured on the front. So I interviewed some uh, volunteers from a small public hospital, hospital in Dnipropetrovsk uh, or Dnipro and documented the basic tasks that they uh, uh, conducted uh, in 2015. And that included the provision of basic comfort items uh, like supplies of pillows, bed sheets, mattresses, blankets, uh, and so on. Uh, personal comfort items, uh, clothing for uh, soldiers who would all often be brought to the hospital with uh, no personal belonging, uh, razors, uh, uh, personal care packages, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, they also uh, established additional nutrition chain and because there was an understanding that even though hospitals provide food for soldiers, uh, soldiers would also appreciate homemade food uh, uh, as a sign of care on behalf of community at large. They also uh, fundraised for medication and medical equipment um, uh, expensive medical equipment that was lacking at the hospitals because the budget of these hospitals were not adjusted to uh, uh, to cope with the influx of patients uh, in the frontline region. So there was a lack, uh, the, 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 a lot of things uh, were lacking and it was difficult to take care of soldiers. So volunteers came in to uh, help with that as well. And they also conducted hospital rep repairs, like large hospital repairs, repairing leaking roofs uh, at the hospital, removing mold from the walls, uh, fixing uh, elevators, and so on. Many of my respondents talked about the horrible conditions uh, at the hospitals, and uh, they said that their efforts were directed to make sure that soldiers recover in a decent, decent uh, environment. Based on this typology and diverse tasks that volunteers undertook, we see that they had very diverse preoccupations. And this is, uh, and uh, very diverse preoccupations uh, and uh, provided all sorts of resources, uh, services, and welfare. And this is something that is usually provided top down by the state, uh, but here the provision, the provision of services was enabled from uh, below. Uh, so in my research, I used the concept of limited statehood to outline the areas where the Ukrainian state uh, critically lacked the ability to reach out and take care of um, individuals uh, most affected by war. The areas where local bureaucracies and hospitals uh, were incapable of providing sufficient assistance because of lacking resources, incompetence, corruption, and so on. And in this context, uh, civilian volunteers uh, can be seen as functional equivalents of the state, uh, where they perform some of the functions that are usually attributed to the state. But their work uh, went uh, well beyond that. Uh, and right now, I would like to talk about less visible uh, uh, dimensions of volunteer work that are not always uh, talked about. The first such aspect is uh, rights-based uh, interventions conducted on behalf of uh, war-affected populations. And the second uh, type of work is emotional labor that uh, volunteers invested into their engagement. What do I mean by rights-related uh, interventions? So for example, legally, uh, soldiers and war veterans uh, are entitled to a set of uh, rights such as access to land uh, for personal use, reduced tariffs for utilities, subsidies for education, and so on. So these are entitlements that are formally conferred, conferred uh, on them by the state. Uh, in reality, however, uh, various barriers existed in uh, uh, soldiers and war veterans exercising or accessing these rights. As one of my respondents indicated, when someone says, let's give land to war veterans, no one thinks where to get the land, how to allocate, and uh, how to locate and allocate it, what is the process, where to go with a request like that. The procedures and mechanisms uh, are not established. And so ambiguities and unclarities of this sort 
uh, created barriers to exercise these rights and also uh, grounds for abuse at the local level where, for example, land slots would be appropriated by bureaucrats or judges who knew the, how to take advantage of the existing procedures. Uh, also, corruption and illegal practices uh, of bureaucrats and military higher-ups violated the rights and entitlements uh, of soldiers. Uh, there were instances when military higher-ups would appropriate the salary of regular soldiers or uh, staff at the hospital would uh, request um, uh, informal payments to provide health care um, uh, that was supposed to be provided uh, free of charge to these categories of people. And the situation was similar for in the internally displaced individuals, uh, as there were many insta instances when local bureaucrats would derail or create barriers for them to access welfare payments, allegedly, again, to illicit bribes. Uh, it was so prevalent that one of my respondents indicated that uh, even staff at morgue re requested numerous documents and created bureaucratic hurdles to elicit payments. Uh, also, there were many uh, procedural difficulties as the procedures that existed in Ukraine did not reflect uh, war realities. For example, one procedure pertained to the reestablishment of ID documents, and it was very, a very cumbersome procedure. So a lot of NDPs could not uh, uh, reestablish their documents, and as a result, could not access welfare payments that they legally qualified for. Uh, so in these cases, uh, volunteers work to address um, these barriers and violations either through case-by-case -case interventions uh, or by attempting to, to change regula existing regulations and legislation. And where these efforts were not successful, uh, they would raise awareness about the, pro the problems and the infringement of uh, rights to increase the pressure on bureaucrats and people responsible uh, for in these areas to change, uh, to change the situation. So in this way, uh, I, uh, I use the concept of substantive citizenship to, to uh, kind of like um, capture the ways civilian volunteers enacted the rights of war affected uh, populations and made sure that their rights are not just uh, out there on, on paper, but also that they can exercise them. Uh, the second less visible aspect of volunteer work um, has to do with emotional uh, labor that uh, volunteers invested in their engagement, and that was especially visible in 2015 when the need for emergency assistance sub sub assistance um, subsided a little bit, and uh, volunteers increasingly invested their time and energy into mediating trauma and suffering caused by the war by uh, attending to the emotional distress of combatants uh, uh, who were often unprepared uh, to military service or who suffered immensely from the uh, lack of resources and all sorts of uh, uh, deficiencies that existed in the military. Many uh, volunteers I talked to, and a lot of them were women, uh, stated that their ma main goal was not to remedy all the deficiencies uh, existent uh, in the army or not to um, address all the needs generated by war, but to ensure that combatants uh, know that their military service uh, is appreciated by the community at large, that it's valued. And so they sought to reciprocate through their uh, physical and emotional labor. And different initiatives drew on this understanding of, uh, uh, on this understanding that emotional support is significant, that it's uh, meaningful and it's something worth investing into. And this type of work, uh, I should note, uh, was um, seen as especially important uh, given the ambiguity around military service uh, in the regions where combatants would not be readily recognized as defenders, as heroes that are out there to uh, defend the state, but sometimes would be seen as traitors uh, who, who kill their own compatriots. So the ambiguity about uh, the war in, um, pushed uh, a lot of volunteers to create additional discourses of heroism and appreciation around military service. And many noted that these discourses and this uh, uh, emotional labor work to address a sense of disillusionment among combatants uh, about the lack of change uh, and a lack of uh, state support. So it was something very important, very significant. And this uh, em like emotionally uh, marked uh, ties that uh, 
emerged uh, between uh, civilian volunteers and combatants also worked to sustain volunteer engagement long term. So uh, a lot of uh, my respondents mentioned that what kept them in uh, uh, going with this volunteer engagement was because there was some emotional uh, exchange, interchange, a sense of responsibility towards uh, those they uh, helped. I want to conclude by uh, talking briefly about the current uh, situation with volunteer networks uh, that I studied and also more broadly about the current trends. This is uh, uh, my side project. I'm trying to trace the trajectories of civilian volunteers with precision to see where they ended uh, four years uh, into the war and how like different modes of engagement that volunteering generated. Uh, Station Kharkiv, one of the organizations that I mentioned, uh, it, the current situation is that uh, they institutionalized and professionalized. They developed uh, various partnerships with uh, international organizations and diaspora communities to continue their activities. Their main focus, however, shifted uh, from providing assistance uh, to internally displaced persons to long-term projects aid aimed at the community at large. So for example, in the summer of this year, they launched a new project to create opportunities for, for uh, women in precarity and help them get self-employed. And they said that they don't want to single out IDPs anymore because um, that inhibits their integration. And, and instead, they want to direct their efforts uh, at, uh, at community where IDPs are seen as part of the uh, part of that community. So here we see that a community-oriented mode of citizenship emerged out of war engagement. The war rerouted the, the, the professional and personal trajectories of volunteers who previously did not have any experience in, in humanitarian work, but now they uh, build this uh, uh, organization, uh, Kharkiv, uh, Station Kharkiv, that has been successfully functioning over some years. Uh, when it comes to the uh, military engagement, uh, there has been a lot of, uh, there has been a disillusionment and disengagement. Um, uh, disengagement in part has to do with the fact that at the initial stage, uh, that kind of volunteering was very uh, overwhelming, very emotionally uh, taxing. So a lot of volunteers suffer from emotional exhaustion at this point, and they feel that they should just step back and take some time for their families and for the, uh, attend back to their professional responsibilities. The network uh, I mentioned, Nebaiduzilude, or Caring People uh, in Odessa, it still exists, uh, but it reduced the in intensity of its work. The number of core volunteers also decreased. So we see, uh, again, this is uh, the work in progress, I'm trying to uh, do some follow-up interviews to see what th these volunteers do at the moment. So I guess I'll, uh, I'll end there, and thank you very much for your attention. You. Our last presenter, uh, Dr. Alexander Melnik. Uh, Alexander holds a master degree from the University of Alberta and PhD from the University of Toronto. <laughs> His doctoral thesis is devoted to the historical politics and reconstruction of political communities in Ukraine during the Second World War. A chapter of the dissertation appeared recently in Jarbücher für Geschichte Osteuropas under the title Stalinist Justice as a Site of Memory, Anti-Jewish Violence in Kiev's Podil District in 1941 through the prism of Soviet investigative documents. After 2014, his interest extended to contemporary issues and the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Dr. Melnik is dealing currently with Soviet and Ukrainian modern history, political violence, and cultural identities issues. I have to add that Alexander spent two years at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, first as the Stasiuk and recently the Baiduja postdoctoral fellow. I do believe that the time spent at the Institute was productive and beneficial to both of them. This presentation is based on a large study that concerns itself with specific aspects of sort of humanitarian aspects of the war, the treatment of the war casualties in this context. More than four years into the armed conflict in the Donbass, the war has exerted significant humanitarian costs. More than 10,000 people lost their lives, including members of the Ukrainian armed forces and other law enforcement agencies, Ukrainian volunteer formations, anti-government insurgents, Russian military personnel, and thousands of non-combatants. Perhaps as many as two million people have become displaced. Summary executions were certainly rare, but unknown number of people experienced various forms of abuse and personal deprivations, including unlawful imprisonment, torture, 
sexual violence, forced labor, and expropriations. The areas adjacent to the war zone are still littered with landmines and unexploded ammunition, which pose considerable risks to the civilian population, particularly children. More than a million people are set to experience food insecurity near the war zone. Finally, the war adversely affected the economy of the region and exposed the population to novel ecological threats. So this is the basic facts. Yet, the geopolitical significance and human costs of the war notwithstanding, in historical terms, the armed conflict in the Donbass must be classified as rather limited, whether it comes to terms of the involvement of the population, fairly low percentage of the population on both sides is actually involved in fighting or uh, sort of support activities. Uh, the intensity of fighting itself, it varied over the course of the conflict, but it is a low intensity conflict for the most part. The number of casualties or the scope of violence against non-combatants. Overall, the military developments in the region remain within the larger post-World War II trend towards what scholars call humanization of warfare. This is apparent not in the decline of the number of interstate wars, the ascendance of the international humanitarian law, and the relative decrease of violence against civilians. In the Donbass, there is such restraint what's characteristic not only of the Ukrainian government and of the insurgents who are the principal combatants on the ground, but also of the Russian Federation and even Russian nationalists, some of whom were in principle committed to the total war and the destruction of the Ukrainian state by the military means. I think this is important to keep in mind because uh, of the informational warfare that, it, that accompanied the conflict and that used to drive the aggression and uh, escalation of violence. Uh, and in principle, it is important to keep this in perspective because when you put it on the grand scale of other conflicts that have taken place historically, particularly in the 20th century, this is relatively small conflict. So within this larger context, this paper is an attempt to examine the specific problem of the treatment of wartime casualties with a view to jumpstart a discussion about a broader set of questions related to the subject of cultural identities, intercommunal ethics, and the politics of reconciliation in the area. At the center of the study is the initiative Evacuation 200, which the Department of Civilian and Military Cooperation of Ukraine's Armed Forces uh, launched in early September 2014 in conjunction with the dramatic defeat of the Ukrainian forces at Ilovaisk. Composed primarily of civilian volunteers affiliated with World War II Memorial Societies, the mission has already returned from the war zone and from the rebel-controlled territories close to 800 bodies of Ukrainian servicemen and civilians, with a few dozen bodies of insurgents and Russian volunteers returned to the DNR, primarily DNR. Some LNR was not much involved in these activities. By elucidating the activities of these networks, their relationships with the organs of the Ukrainian state, um, Ukrainian civil society, and similar groups in the rebel-controlled territories, the paper makes a set of arguments about the continued existence of shared commemorative cultures and attitudes. These cultures, I would argue, survived the post-Maidan transformations of the Ukrainian body politic and contributed to the preservation of areas of ethical consensus that have enabled limited cooperation across the political divides, even in the midst of fighting. So I will not launch into the discussion of military operations. It's, I have a, an entire article on the subject, uh, but it is necessary to point out why so many bodies of Ukrainian servicemen ended up on the territories that is now controlled by the DNR and LR. And uh, one of the reasons was efforts by Ukrainian forces to seal the border. So it's in this salience that they came became eventually surrounded and also came under artillery fire. And, and later, in, in the second half of August, they also began the Russian military intervention, so they had to pull out out of this salience in early August, and then the general retreat became in, in, in late August. But particularly important was the defeat at Ilovaisk, where during the single day, more than 400 soldiers and members of volunteer formations were killed in one day. So that's, if you put that in perspective, during the entire uh, April, May, and June, Ukraine lost around maybe 400 plus soldiers in three months, and that was in one day that total was exceeded. The informal dialogue with the insurgents was in progress throughout the summer 2014, both um, on concerning various issues, the exchange of prisoners of war, but also casualties. Military on the ground often negotiated exchanges of bodies and prisoners of war with individual warlords, while higher level discussions were carried out by the security service of Ukraine and by political representatives, either directly or through the, through the middlemen, such as Viktor Medvedchuk and Nestor Shufrich. 
At some point, they also began negotiations between representatives of the Ukrainian general staff and their Russian counterparts. That was already in August. Such discussions intensified in late August and early September 2014 after the defeat of Ukrainian forces at Ilovaisk. And in fact, the agreement was reached initially that the Russians allowed the Ukrainian military to retrieve bodies from Ilovaisk, but they only could take about 200 soldiers and a significant number still remain dispersed throughout the territory. So as a result of these agreements, the responsibility for coordinated removal of the bodies of Ukrainian military personnel from, from the rebel-controlled territories ended up with the newly created Department of Civilian and, and Military Cooperation of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. So it's in understanding why this was taking place, it's important to keep in mind of the Geneva Convention that, that seeks to regulate conduct of warfare by various combatants, and one of the article concerns the treatment of the casualties of the war, which proscribes that they should be treated in a dignified manner, so properly buried, not mutilated, and things like that. It's important to note that at that time, the Ukrainian side negotiated from the position of weakness and had to eschew political discussions. Instead, the emphasis was placed on humanistic values, Christian ethics, cultural affinities, and shared attitudes towards the dead. Rebel representatives demanded that only civilian volunteers should be allowed to perform this necessary but extremely unpleasant tasks. Another condition was that the movement of search teams in the field should be coordinated with the DNR, who would supply them with escorts from the ranks of the insurgency. Obviously, one reason for that was to prevent sort of information gathering in the areas near to the combat zone, but also to provide a modicum of security to the volunteers themselves because the situation on the ground was very chaotic and a lot of rogue groups were moving around. Like the, the ins insurrection itself until the Russian intervention was pretty decentralized. There were very many groups led by individual warlords who operated on the terrain and they often did not subordinate themselves to any central authority. So agreement with one party could not guarantee safety in principle, because somebody else could, could, could come on site and cause trouble. So who were the participants of the mission? So, there was, so one important institution was the Military Historical Museum of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. Uh, but even more important was the so-called Soyuz Narodnaya Pamet, uh, Union People's Memory, which was a national network of grassroots organizations which had for years uh, conducted search for remains of soldiers of World War II and World War I, and also victims of Soviet political repression. So genealogically, these groups had their roots in the Soviet search movements uh, of the late Soviet period. Um, and they shared the same ethos of honoring the dead, of returning names to the unknown soldiers. And many of the re commemorative rituals in which they engage to this day is also hark back to the Soviet practices. So, so it is a very important to keep in mind for, for why they would be operating in the rebel territories because of, of this affinity, sort of in terms of the, where the myth of the Second World War occupied in their sort of conception of political and cultural identity. So Yuz Narodnaya Pamet also maintained ties with similar groups outside Ukraine, in, including in Russia. And it's interesting that after the start of the conflict, when they started planning this work in the rebel controlled territories, some Russian organizations expressed interest in participating in the mission, but the initiative was blocked by the Ukrainian armed forces. So there's kind of this limit to transnationalism in, time, in times of war that was very apparent in this case, even despite the certain affinities. So in terms of their understanding of the war, many act activists exhibited pacifist understanding of the war experience and uh, and the leaders of the organization publicly declared their neutrality in the conflict. And, and part of it was probably to facilitate their work in the area because it would be very problematic to, to, to say otherwise. But some activists nonetheless supported the government of the narrative of the war in the East. And in fact, particularly the museum workers participated actively in commemorative activities that were in line with the official conception. They also perceived their activities as historical in their own right. Many documented own work, pretty meticulously. Museum workers collected exhibits in the war zone. It's like shells, documents, flags, and they, that would be brought and then would be used in exhibitions commemorating the war as it was happening. And, uh, and most importantly, they filmed the activities in the rebel-controlled territories despite prohibitions. Like, technically, they were not supposed to do so. It was a very risky move, but they collected significant amount of footage which was later converted in, 
in the documentary film that journalists affiliated with organizations produced. And uh, it's about six hours of footage and commentary by participants of, of this organization that detail various aspects of their work in their rebel control territories, including encounters with the insurgents and civilians. And, and that's a very ambi ambiguous, complicated picture that emerges out of these interviews and comments that they made about it. The organization from the start had a pretty uneasy relationship with the state authority, primarily due to insufficient funding. And uh, they, they expected to receive more support from the state, let's say, that, than they received in actuality. So in terms of challenges of working in the rebel control territories, uh, many activists referred to physical, emotional, and relational stress that resulted from handling decomposing severely damaged bodies in the rebel control territories. But, it, but another important issue is that they operated with very minimal guarantees of securities in the rebel control territories. Although they were often accompanied by, were always accompanied by escorts from among the ranks of anti-government uh, forces they were frequently approached by belligerent combatants who threatened them and abused them verbally. And sometimes the escorts themselves could display such attitudes. Then there were other issues related to general insecurity in the war zone, such as minefields, periodic shelling, and things like that. In describing their work in the rebel controlled territories, many activists dis ref referenced understanding that they had to act submissively in the situation that were conflict-led, conflict and they avoided political discussions and generally understood that if the rebels were causing problems, they had to keep quiet and just listen. So that was their position. But they also noted ambiguities of the war and the various complexities of the war experience uh, of many people in the rebel-controlled territory. Some, for example, referenced rebels who had relatives fighting on the Ukrainian side. Others said that they talked to people who said they joined the fight after the home was destroyed by Ukrainian artillery shell and some relatives died. And, and, and episodes like this are very common. Some talked about civilians who were dispossessed of their property or of Ukrainian loyalists who find themselves trapped in the rebel-controlled territories and can't exit and they feel isolated and insecure. In fact, an, oh, they talked about one woman whose son was fighting in the 25th Airborne Brigade, was one of the most important Ukrainian military units uh, uh, during this summer campaign. Uh, but, but she herself left in the territory that ended up under the rebel control, and uh, she constantly received threats. So eventually her son called an insurgent who was his school buddy, and he asked him explicitly not, like, whatever is the conflict between us, but do not touch the mothers. So this kind of ambiguities and complexities of the war experience sort of form a very important backdrop to what they talk about. Finally, it's important to know the gradual, they reference gradual increase of trust between themselves and the rebels and the population of the rebel-controlled territories. Once they started bringing, uh, once they, they worked there for two years, so with time they get familiar with some of these people, but they also started bringing rebel casualties to the Denair specifically. And so, and on one occasion, they, they even received a Ukrainian POW for returning several Ossetian fighters killed in, near Marienka in, in June 2015. Altogether, between 2014 and 2016, uh, when the organization stopped working the rebel-controlled territories, they recovered more than 800 bodies from the war zone, including 300 from the rebel-controlled territories proper. A few dozen combatants were returned to the Denair. Conclusions. So the paper made, makes the case for the necessity of separating the reality of the armed conflict in the Donbass, which in historical terms must be categorized as rather limited from the narratives propagated as part of the informational warfare by belligerent sides. The tendency to exaggerate the crimes of the enemy and downplay one's own is of course universal. The imperatives of conflict resolution and long-term reconciliation at the societal level, however, dictate the attention be redirected to a set of themes that emphasize the responsibility of different sides and common humanity. Within this context, the history of the humanitarian mission evacuation 2000 allows to examine the conflict in the Donbass from a somewhat different angle without succumbing to wishful thinking and unwarranted optimism about the prospects of rapid conflict resolution.
On the positive side, the participants of the search mission have managed to return home and facilitate the identification of the more than 800 victims of the war. Um, members of Ukrainian armed forces, volunteer battalions, as well as insurgents, Russian volunteers, and civilians on, bo on both sides of the front lines. At a time when the state simply didn't have the ability to carry out such an assignment, the mission must be seen as an extraordinary success. The achievement of this goal was predicated primarily on cooperation between individual officers of Ukrainian armed forces and members of World War II memorial societies who performed the hardest part, searching for bodies in the rebel-controlled territories under trying circumstances and often at considerable personal risks. This is the story of ingenuity, social intelligence, personal diplomacy, selfless service, and emotional resilience. The volunteers went where few people were willing to go, and in addition to accomplishing the task, delivered a powerful message of peace, empathy, and humanity. Yet the history of Evacuation 2000 also provides a number of important insights about the nature of the relationship between the volunteers and the Ukrainian state and between the volunteers and the rebel civilians in the DNR and LA. It is the relationship in this triangle that co caution against excessive optimism. At the end of the day, the activists were able to accomplish their objectives in the rebel-controlled territories can come face to face with the humanity of insurgents and local civilians because they have essentially renounced any claim to power and submitted to rebels' authority. Even under these circumstances, the men ran considerable risks where real political dialogue was completely out of the question. On the macro level, the problem of power continues to plague the relations between Ukraine and Russia and between Ukraine and the DNR LNR. Similar problems illustrate the relationship between Soyuz Narodnaya Pamet and the organs of the Ukrainian state. On the one hand, the armed forces had no misgivings about leaning on volunteer associations when they needed them, providing minimal support. But when the volunteers completed the most difficult part of the job, they were rapidly sidelined. With officers of the CMIS Department of Civilian and Military Cooperation taking over the mission evacuation to 2200 in 2016, the narrative ambiguity advocated by Poiskaviki likewise became an afterthought. The views of the officers, it appears, are very much aligned with the official conception of the war and compromises may not be part of their identity. In a sense, these tensions and narrative conflicts are at the core of nation building in contemporary Ukraine. How the Ukrainian society revolves, resolves them may determine not only the practical outcome of the armed conflict in the Donbass, but also the future of the Ukrainian state and nation. Okay. Thank you so much. And now it's time for questions. Uh, my question is for Dr. Natalia Stepanuk. Um, very interesting research and volunteer movement. I'm personally involved with a couple of volunteers in Kharkiv. So they're often uh, uh, sort of unspoken heroes of this unfortunate conflict. So my question is, in your research, uh, you find why they became volunteers? Because in Ukraine, especially in eastern Ukraine, where I'm from, it's not sort of common for people to go and volunteer their time, especially sacrifice a lot of their personal time. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested in, in sort of psychological portrait of these people, volunteers. So if you can elaborate on that, I would appreciate things. Uh, Oksana, I understood that you conducted some kind of focus group analysis on post territories, right? Okay. It's a post territory, but it's in-depth interviews. Yeah, in depth. So it's I see, I see, I see. Then uh, how could you receive permissions of uh, DNR? Uh, LNR? Uh, for example, I wanted to conduct uh, field work in uh, Gorovka, but the DNR government didn't, uh, didn't allow me to go there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, please. My question is for Natalia and Oksana, and it's kind of similar to yours. I was interested in your discussion of motivations, but I think we also need to kind of under, try and understand how did these people decide to volunteer and, and become combatants, which is a slightly different question. And, and I'm, I'm wondering about the role that families and friends and the kinds of discussions people had uh, that set the context for these decisions to volunteer and can you give us some insight into that? My question is for Oksana, it's not exactly to your presentation, but I know that you work on travel issues. So my question is, can you identify particular um, 
trauma and uh, trauma for military fighters and related to their experience in war. For example, research of our colleague Mikhail Midakov, he said that surprisingly the people not experience so huge trauma comparing with people so-called Facebook fighters. So they are more <coughs> affected by trauma than military fighters. Can you explain <laughs> on your research in detail what kind of particular trauma the people have or don't have and how Ukrainian organization, government have to address this trauma experience? Okay, question for Alexander. Uh, why do you think the Ukrainian army did so poorly uh, in the initial stage of the conflict? And do you think that it was a major breakdown from the side of the Ukrainian authorities to call this mm -hmm. Uh, military operation, anti-terrorist operation, because you refer to Geneva Convention, and in fact, Geneva Convention does not recognize mercenaries uh, or members of PMCs. If you're talking about uh, the uh, rebel fighters, well, they didn't have to comply with this uh, Geneva Convention because they were now there, and they didn't sign the document. And I think that's a question that I would like to ask, uh, you are right people to, to be asked. And maybe my question, yes, <laughs> because it's your sociologist, uh, most of you. Um, and maybe my question will be a little bit personal. I'm from Kharkiv, and I remember how it was in 2014 in Kharkiv. And um, there was very difficult and very unstable political situation. And there was a high risk <coughs> that Kharkiv will follow Donetsk and Lugansk path. And it didn't happen. Could you please explain why it didn't happen? Maybe there is some explanation from a sociological point. Uh, thank you for all the questions. Uh, the first question was about uh, the motivations of civilian volunteers, uh, why they decided to um, uh, got engaged. Based on the interviews I conducted, I identified three, I, I, I identified three uh, motivations. The first one was, um, well, not so much a motivation as uh, volunteers would say, well, it wasn't much of a decision for us. Um, there were still local uh, Maidan protests in Kharkiv, Odessa, and Dnipropetrovsk, even though they were not very uh, large, sizable. And so for some <laughs> activists, uh, um, the outbreak of uh, war just uh, redirected their activism towards new needs. So they, it was the continuation of the same, the same fight as they, as, as they put it. And because they were known for their participation in, um, in the Maidan protests, uh, they would get a, a higher number of requests for help. People would know them, they would approach them for, to uh, ask for assistance. Uh, the second group of people were not uh, engaged in the Maidan protests in any ways, but they said that the very alarming uh, situation in the region, the instability the risk of uh, Kharkiv, uh, the, the, the Novorossiya discourses that were very prevalent, uh, the possibility of uh, invasion, that uh, there, were, there were a lot of rumors uh, uh, about that, that that really alarmed them. Uh, they felt like the war was knocking on their door, and they felt that if they don't get engaged, uh, the next thing that might happen is that they would uh, be stuck in the war situation. So they tried, like they got engaged to constrain the war in Donbass and not let the war uh, spill over to their homes, uh, as they explained. And the third uh, motivation was uh, that uh, it was just um, like a um, humane response to precarity, because these regions, uh, had Eastern and uh, Southern Ukraine accepted uh, the highest number of um, internally displaced persons, uh, especially uh, Kharkiv compared to Western Ukraine. At some point, uh, officially, uh, there were over 300,000 officially registered IDPs, but the actual number was uh, much higher. Like it was the highest number outside of uh, the government controlled uh, Don uh, Donbass uh, region. So just seeing people like you, uh, they had a lot more physical contact with precarity uh, they have they saw all these uh, emergency uh, vehicle um, vehicles in the city so that it was just uh, maybe a, an emotional a sporadic response but eventually when the, they uh, after the first contact they saw the extent of needs and they just uh, uh, stayed because they could not uh, walk away Thank you for your question. Uh, why did the Ukrainian army did so poorly? It, it's a very large question, and it would take a very long time to discuss all the factors. But I think the main thing is uh, there's very small number of combat-ready units at the start of the conflict. We are talking maybe at 5,000 soldiers 
primarily contract soldiers who were capable <coughs> of wielding weapons effectively at the time. The mobilization begins in March, and by the end of May, they are able to increase the size of military forces significantly. But, but there is an influx of fighting who had maybe a couple of weeks of training, very poor slugginists, mm -hmm. Cohere combat cohesion. coherent yeah. cohesion. So when they find themselves in the condition of fighting, they they can't function. Many withdraw from the battlefields or full, refuse to fulfill orders. It's very common pattern. So in practice, the heavy duty fighting is done with, by very limited number of professional soldiers. Right? Particularly 25th Airborne Brigade is doing a lot of fighting in various parts of, of the combat zones throughout, from the start of the Ukrainian offensive operations near Slavyansk and all the way through August. And they sustained extremely heavy casualties during time. It was like more than 100 soldiers killed and about 500 wounded during the summer campaign. Uh, and they're probably the unit that suffered the most casualties. Uh, the mobilized soldiers oftentimes uh, perform secondary duties. They, the men block post or they move in the footsteps of the better prepared units. Like, for example, when in August, the 95th Airborne Brigade was trying to sort of do the second sealing of the border further away from the line, it was followed by units of the Suris Brigade, which was less prepared. And, um, and, and it is a pattern in many places. Uh, but this is military concept. And, then, then there, are, there are other issues like logistics and poor equipment, uh, but there's also a political and sort of strategic concept. They, they operated out of the assumption, it seems to me, that the Russia would not intervene militarily. So, and they committed also some operational mistakes. When they tried to seal the border in June, they didn't capture Saur Mogila from the start. So the rebels retained control of the height for more than a month, so they could control the deployment of supplies in this narrow strip of land that stretched for several dozen kilometers. So rebel diversionary groups and artillery shelling could be done with virtual impunity. And, uh, and the real, by mid-July, the Ukrainian forces encircled, and then Russians also started shelling them. After they lost the border, that essentially the summer campaign was decided, and Ilovaisk was an icing on the cake. In terms Sorry. of mm -hmm. Geneva Convention, uh, I believe they may not do it consciously, but a lot of combatants operate, they are not World War II warriors. Like, they have particular conceptions of political identities. They tend to see their opponents as marginal politically, with the majority population of the territories seen as potentially assimilable into the political community. This is true of not only Ukrainians and DNR fighters, but even of Russian nationalists. They see junta in Kiev, for example, but the population itself, at least in southeastern Ukraine, is supposed to be easily assimilable into the political community that they try to build. So oftentimes they use this sort of conception strategically in how, for example, they treat prisoners of war. There's oftentimes the elaborate showing off how humane they are in the treatment of pure darkness. In, pra in practice, of course, violence and abuses take place, but oftentimes there's also an effort to show more humane forms of treatment, publicly at least. And the same applies to the treatment of casualties. Uh, there's plenty of footage when they exchange bodies on the field, come on, fighters themselves, they call on the phones and uh, they bring and, and they also talk about these things. It's not like this inherent hostility. There's a certain kind of common ethos. They understand they are fighting each other, but they also, it's not a total war. They, it's not the war of annihilation in any way. Thank you, Alexander. The somewhat about military trauma, uh, it's, it's really very deep, um, difficult question for our society because, as I can see this moment, only in uh, 2016, uh, our psychological um, society will start to work hardly with these questions. Um, just before many people who come back from the uh, battle battlefield um, feel uh, not uh, ca uh, ca enough care, and uh, many of them um, have many stereotypes about psychological health because uh, they think that it's very high uh, level of uh, payment uh, to, to the services and uh, they're not sure that is a high level of um, quality of this help. Once in another moment, uh, many programs and many um, present contemporary uh, types of help for these people 
uh, works with the post-traumatic syndrome, but I think it's uh, not uh, adequate to the situation because now uh, we have still trauma situation. It's not post-traumatic syndrome. Uh, but really the situation pushed uh, the uh, psychological services in Ukraine, and now we have a really uh, very intensive development of the services. Uh, just if you, uh, a very quick co comment uh, to what uh, Oksana had to say about trauma, uh, based on the research that I conducted, you know, it was a question that I uh, pondered upon for, for some time because for me, uh, just collecting information was traumatic. And then when I went out there in the field and I talked to people, yes, they uh, talked about the traumatic aspects of their engagement, but uh, they also felt p positive uh, about uh, many things. Uh, for example, about the unity that they discovered among Ukrainians that they uh, uh, suddenly saw that uh, like many people that, as they said, were their soulmates who think the same, and they said that they previously did not know that we have so many good people in Ukraine. And I think that positive sense about engagement and about the, the fact that people cared, I think it worked to me mediate trauma in a, in a way and create, uh, created positive discourses that also like, addressed uh, like, uh, certain aspects of, of, of the traumatic experiences. Let me uh, briefly identify three points that I was going to comment. I'm not commenting them right now, but the issues of uh, border and uh, borderland, they are not the same. And Ukrainian uh, political border is not supported by U the Ukrainian symbolic or uh, soft border, not yet. I learned that it is almost impossible even to establish strictly defined line between those who are uh, who we used to call pro-Russian rebels in the Ukrainian army because for technical reasons it's not possible at all to say nothing about this uh, famous or infamous uh, European wall uh, you know uh, all this stuff the second issue is the issue of uh, regional uh, of regional uh, identity and regions I'm not so sure that we are dealing with real regions and regional uh, political, uh, politically uh, articulated movements. Sometimes uh, I have uh, the impression that we are dealing with, uh, you know, some inventions, political, uh, politically informed uh, discourses rather than uh, social realities. And the third issue is about uh, 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 people. Our um, panel is focused on real people with real experience. So that's why I believe it is important, but dealing with people from the borderland, is, it's a challenge. I'm glad to hear that uh, our sociologists uh, take, take, uh, used to take into account both uh, rational and irrational components of their identity. And the issue of identity is not of primary importance for them. This is the issue, how to survive. Uh, I have to stop here, and uh, thank you very much for all our presenters. Thank you for being involved. It is time for lunch break. Thank you.